Okay, so welcome everybody for another uh, talk in the series of Fungosphere lectures. We're very lucky and happy tonight to have Joe Rhodes from Imperial College joining us. Uh, Joe's got a background interest in Cryptococcus, Candida auris, and Aspergillosis, and she's really focused on the emergence of resistance in those pathogens. And that's what she's going to be talking to us about tonight, I hope. So welcome, Joe, um, and it's the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I know it's a late one for you guys um, and an, an early one for me ish. Um, so, yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, acquisition of drug resistance fungal infections from the environment. I'm going to be focusing primarily on Aspergillus, touching briefly on Auris, um, given this is like some of the recent stuff. So, yeah, I started at Imperial nine years ago. Um, this year is my ninth year with Matt um, at the helm um, and just basically moved from crypto to Aspergillus to Candida and then just kind of like working on all three. Um, and then I'm just basically now working on if there's a fungal outbreak, I work on it. So I just basically work on anything. I primarily do just bioinformatics and um, genome sequencing analysis now. And I leave the lab work to much more talented people than me. Um, so I'm just going to start my talk. I know my desktop looks inc incredibly busy. Um, does that all look okay for everyone? That's perfect. Cool. Okay. So, okay. So we recently renamed ourselves to the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis. Previously, we were just um, Department of Infectious Disease Analysis. So um, we've got a snazzy new title. So obviously, we all know, you all know, that fungi are ubiquitous. They diverged from the animal and plant kingdoms approximately 1.5 million years ago. And there's thought to be about 150,000 fungal species, but it's estimated to be higher. So there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, that said that there could be anything between 2.2 and 3.8 million species. So our knowledge of uh, fungi in the wild is pretty limited. Um, about 8,000 of these species cause disease in plants. Obviously, we've seen that recently with things like ash dieback here in the UK. And then obviously elsewhere around the world, we've seen um, you know fungal infections of Banana plants, chocolate plants, cocoa plants, which is devastating, coffee, or the, the works. Um, and just over 600 associated with humans as commensals or pathogens. So actually it's a really small amount that have kind of spilled over into, into plant and human diseases. So when I first joined the Fisher group, he just got this really nice paper in Nature to show that fungal outbreaks over recent decades are increasing. And obviously Matt's work is primarily focused on Botrachochytrium um, and, and the mass amphibian diebacks. And then we've, we've started to sort of branch out into wild, other wildlife diseases, so white nose syndrome. And recently we've been looking at um, aspergillosis in the Kakapo, parrot over in New Zealand. So we've been part of the of the Kakapo Aspergillosis Consortium as well, looking, looking at that. Um, you've got ash dieback um, and other plant um, fungal infections. And then of course, you've got the human infections like Cryptococcus. Um, so yeah, so the, the total number of alerts are both animal and plant uh, fungal infections are increasing. Um, and basically we want to figure out what's driving that. So again, Matt sort of collaborates with Sarah Gurr um, quite a lot and, and just came up with this nice little schematic of how environmental change is driving new patterns of fungal disease worldwide. So <clears throat> basically we know that we can get selection for virulence and resistance to antifungal chemicals artificially, so artificial selection, just basically through the way that we farm, basically through you know, how we grow crops. We have um, a monoculture, genetic uniformity over large areas. We are using um, similar drugs to, um, similar class drugs to what we use medically as well. But also there's these anthro, um, anthropogenic opportunities, so climate change. So Arturo Casadevall is quite hot on this at the moment. It's just like how climate change is changing uh, so species distributions and perhaps has contributed to the emergence of pathogens such as 
Candida auris. And we're also contributing to long distance dispersal. So we're moving, we're moving, well, perhaps not in the last year, obviously, but we are moving ourselves. You know, we're going on exotic holidays, we're going to like all these fancy conferences and all this kind of stuff. Um, but we're also moving stuff around the world. We're moving fruit, veg, meat, um, and also pets as well. So like the amphibian uh, mass dieback, we think originated in the Far East and basically through the amphibian pet trade has spread across the world. So we're moving new pathogens to new places just by our activity. Um, so every single year, not this year or, net, or last year, unfortunately, Matt goes to the Pyrenees and goes to the same lakes to basically count the number of amphibians that, have, that are visibly dead for, from BD um, and also to take samples to just kind of, uh, you know, test and make sure that it is BD and, and which lineage of BD. So this is a picture of him here kind of like trekking through the mountains and coming across this this fungal sack and just sort of noticing how the spores are just easily dispersed on the air and as humans we're exposed to environmental fungi um, every single day um, and basically depending on the size of the spores they can sit in different parts of the lung um, so if they're if they're slightly bigger they sit a bit higher if they're slightly smaller they can get um, down into the alveoli and um, you know we're, re we're really interested in, in, in all of these and we're, we're adding to them all the time so um, uh, so we're seeing some outbreaks of some pretty weird uh, pathogens at the moment in our COVID wards in our COVID patients. Um, so a few years ago, pre-COVID, we decided to set up this Burkhard seven-day spore trap on the roof of St Mary's, um, which is the hospital in Paddington, which is where I work. And we also set one up in a rural location in, in Hertfordshire, um, which is sort of like one of the home counties. And I'm not in this photo because I have a fear of heights and this wall literally comes up to like your thigh. And I was just like, I'm not, I'm not doing that, I'm not a chance. So, you know, we got we, these three lovely people, um, Rebecca, who's the health and safety person, Jen, who's a PhD student. I'll talk a little bit more about her work later on. And this guy's called Slim because, you know, he's fairly slim and he's the maintenance guy and he was the one doing all the heavy lifting. And basically, you know, you just change the tape every single week um, and it just filters 10 liters of air per minute. And basically whatever's in the air just gets stuck to the tape and then you can just chop it up and um, PCR it or, you know, or sequence, uh, Sanger sequence, whatever you want to do to see what's present. Um, so we, we, were, we were expecting to see more fungi in the rural location than the urban location, due, just due to the fact that we were using um, azole antifungals in, in, in sort of like the rural locations due to crops and things like that and see less in urban um, because of pollution and things like that. And we found loads of different species attached to the um, attached to the to the to the tapes. And we'll I'll be talking predominantly about aspergillus. But what about resistance? So I'm sure I'm sure you all know, but re resistance occurs in all classes of drugs used against plant and animal fungal infections. Um, and the, the, the six main classes of fungicides are the morphelines. Um, the azoles, you've got um, the MBCs, um, the, the QOIs, um, and then a couple of others which I can't remember. Um, and basically what happens is that you've got dual use of these azoles, both in agricultural settings, but also in animal settings and human settings. It's a little bit like the anti antibiotic problem in that, you know, we use antibiotics agriculturally um, to make chickens bigger to put on weight, you know, we use them in our, in our cattle, but then we also use them medically as well. And what we can see is that the resistance to azoles has increased throughout time in both animal and human um, diseases. And so we are really interested in seeing and in testing this hypothesis that human fungal infections that are drug resistant are originating in the environment. And apparently this is a controversial topic. So this is just an idea of the amount of azole antifungal drugs that we use in the UK in agriculture. So since 
2000, um, there's been a six-fold increase in the application of azoles, and the UK sprays about 250 kilos um, of azoles per year as crop protection. And this and this graph here, it just it just gives you this census ward level estimates of the usage of fungicides just for England for the year 2000. You can see that there's some dark areas where um, there's lots being used, and then the lighter areas is where there's there's hardly any being used. And you would, you know, that's what you'd expect. You'd expect sort of like London um, to not have any. Um, and and this is this is Birmingham here, so you know you expect those places to not have any because they're just highly urban. I'm not quite sure why the Isle of Wight doesn't have any because I know there's quite a few farms there. But it's it's, it's also due to you know reporting um, factors as well. But if you compare this to what's used in the Netherlands and Denmark as well, the UK as a whole is actually using more than our uh, European neighbours. So the predominant uh, aerosolized fungi that we were that we were spotting on the Burkhard in in the Paddington uh, spore trap was Aspergillus. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Aspergillus, it's a fascinating organism. It can grow up to 60 degrees C in soil and compost and it sporulates profusely. So this is a little figure that I've um, that I've uh, swiped from one of Paul Vervey's um, papers where he talks about the three uh, sort of life cycles of Aspergillus and you've, it, it's got a sexual cycle where it, it creates these clystothesia and then you've got the asexual one um, which, which is thought to be the most predominant but then it's also hypothesized as a parasexual cycle as well so you've got these really complex life cycles um, that may or may not exist we're not sure um, we think they do. And basically there's opportunities here for um, recombination to occur through the, the sexual life cycle. And so it's like, you know, the generation of new uh, combinations of resistance polymorphisms. And then when it reproduces asexually, it just has this, this capacity to just have a widespread dispersal um, of something that is potentially highly fit. So yes, um, this is a compost heap. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jen's work. So Jen, um, uh, Jen's PhD has predominantly been on environmental aspergillosis. So she was just literally going around the country um, picking up uh, soil samples from compost heaps um, and just noticing the amount of aspergillus that grows and the amount of drug resistant aspergillus that grows. So I'll talk a little bit more about her work in a minute. And the patient cohorts that are at risk of aspergillosis, the main one is cystic fibrosis for us. So the UK has the second largest cohort of cystic fibrosis patients in the world, the first being the US, and London is kind of like the main centre. And Imperial NHS um, has seems to have the largest cohort in London because we, we do a lot with respiratory medicine. And we've also got, new, to, a, to a lesser extent, neutropenic transplant patients, a few asthmatic um, very rarely do we see it in HIV AIDS, cancer. And then just recently we're starting to see um, aspergillus associated, um, sorry, influenza associated aspergillosis. And then obviously over the past 12 months, we've started to see COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis as well, um, which, is, which is rather concerning. And there's been reports from mainland Europe that the mortality rates can be quite high for, for people with Kappa. And the link with these, we think, is the use of azoles in agriculture and also medically. So for those of you who aren't aware, azoles target the aspergillus ergosterol cell membrane biosynthesis by inhibiting the CYP51 enzyme. They do this in two ways. So firstly, they do an overexpression of CYP51. So there's duplications in the promoter sequence which increase the expression of CYP51A. So the predominant ones are TR34, so we're a repeat of 34 base pairs, and TR46. We're also seeing TR53, TR130. We're, you know, we're, seeing, we're seeing all combinations. Um, basically, you know, you come up with a number, we've probably seen it. And then there's also the structural polymorphisms, which will interfere with the entry of the azole molecules into um, the enzyme's hydrophobic access pocket. So um, I did a, well, I did a paper with my ex-husband a few years ago, which basically looked at um, the L98H, um, which is this one here, which is predominantly seen with the TR34 
um, tandem repeat. And the L90H on its own is capable of making the volume of the of the pocket smaller, so that the uh, the uh, the azole molecules can't get in, and it's just inhibiting. Um, the action there, and and you know there was there were similar sort of actions for all of these, and again we're seeing combinations, um, different combinations, new polymorphisms coming up all the time. So Ali Reza Abdul Rasuli it was um, a PhD student of Matt and Darius Armstrong James's, passed his PhD uh, viva back in 2019, and now is doing better than me. Works at King's College London. He's you know quite a a high up clinician now. Um, and he did this amazing UK surveillance of azole resistant aspergillus. And he saw that in clinical isolates, azole resistance was in 13% of isolates. And they were mostly from cystic fibrosis. And the TR34 L90H combined resistance polymorphism was found in 27% of those azole resistance. So actually, um, you know, it's, it's quite high. And then um, Tom Sewell and Yu Yi Zhang, um, I had said this before when Caitlin attended my last talk, and um, they literally went on this jolly across um, like southern England, like they went all the way up to like Cambridge, down to Brighton and Bournemouth, Bath, and they just literally planned this trip over, you know, where would be good to stop for a drink at the pub, and then they collected samples along the way. It was, you know, it was, it was a very good sampling method. So azole resistance in environmental samples was actually lower than in clinical samples. Um, and then what was really interesting, you remember, remember when I said about the Burkhard, we expected to see more azole resistance in the, in the, in the rural fields than in inner city London. Well, actually what we saw was that in rural fields, resistance was 1%, but in urban flower beds, where the flowers might've been imported um, from anywhere, we get a lot of our flowers from, from mainland uh, Europe, but also, the compost bags as well. So if you open a compost bag and test the compost, they're meant to be heat treated, but they're not heat treated sufficiently enough to kill off all aspergillosis, all aspergillus fumigatus, sorry. So actually in urban flower beds, the rates of azole resistance was higher, which really surprised us. Um, in the clinic, we're seeing increasing incidence of azole resistant aspergillus fumigatus. So um, we collaborate quite heavily with the aspergillus group over in Manchester. They're also seeing an increase. So it's not just London, it's Manchester too. And then they're also seeing it in the Netherlands. We collaborate quite a lot with Paul Vevey and Jacques Mice and Ferry Hagen, um, and they're seeing an increase as well. So it's not, it's not isolated to just, to just London or the UK. So Jen, Jen is currently stressing and trying to finish up her thesis. Um, I've never known anyone plan to get married and hand in their thesis within two weeks of each other, but Jenny's going to do it. Um, she decided she wanted to do like this environmental sample of the UK, um, but didn't necessarily want to go on the on the on the jolly on the road trip to do it. So she employed the citizen science um, approach where she just got people involved and got them to sign up. And um, basically, she just got a PCR seal, sent them out two PCR seals, and all they had to do was stick it down on their windowsill or or somewhere sort of secure outside, and then send it in. Um, so she did she did um, so just to collect air samples. She did them. Uh, she did four over one year. She also did a soil one as well, but she was inundated with aspergillus um, actually, and so she only did that once. Um, she couldn't do it again for sanity. So. This is a it's a picture of the of the UK and just gives you an idea of where she got samples from all the way up in Scotland, um, Northern Ireland, Wales, basically the length of breadth of the UK. And you can see that there's, there's sort of like a there's perhaps a little bit of, you know, azole fumigatus positive right in the middle. But generally speaking, there doesn't really seem to be much sort of spatial clustering in terms of whether you're azole positive or negative. And in terms of how many were resistant, the, the majority that um, were azole resistant were seen in the spring equinox and the autumn equinox, which was surprising for us, actually. Um, we weren't quite, weren't quite expecting that. We were expecting a little bit more for autumn, you know, when the leaves have kind of fallen, you get a little bit of rotting, a little bit of sort of like, you know, decomposition. Um, but actually it was more for the spring. But, you know, in the UK, you have to remember that spring, the weather's a bit crap. 
um, and it's quite windy, it's quite wet, you know, it's a little bit warmer, it gets a little bit muggy. So actually, I, it, this might favour Aspergillus a little bit more. But you also have to take into account the fact that, you know, she had a drop off of participation over the year as well. So that might account for it as well. I think she has done statistical analysis on this to show that this is still significant. Um, but I don't have those numbers to hand. Um, but if you give her a follow on Twitter, she's she's very responsive to questions, even though she's uh, writing up. Um, so my main job is to use genomics to track azole resistant aspergers through time and space. So we have just under 700 sequenced isolates. I am literally going into London straight after this um, because we've just had another 384. Um, dumped on our laps. Um, so that will take us up to pretty much 1000, which is pretty cool. Um, 400 clinical, 288 environmental, two other, I say other, they were kind of like experimentally passaged in a lab um, to kind of try and induce resistance. Um, so I class those as other. Over 40 countries, 100 years. Um, so 1919 to 2019. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I, I think I said this last time, if anyone has anything from Canada or Russia, please send it in because these are massive gaps at the moment. Um, yes, which we would like to fill. Um, so what's really interesting is that we can track the azole resistance through time. So as you can see in 1919, we are seeing this one here pop up. It's an American isolate and it's wild type in CYP51A. So these are all CYP51A polymorphisms. And then as we go through time, we can start to see this, this left-hand side kind of start to fill out a little bit. We start to see some wild types fill out on the right-hand side, more wild types, we start to fill out over the world. And then come to 1998, we're starting to see the first drug resistance polymorphism. So we're seeing this one here filling out in the right-hand side, and it's this G54E mutation. It's somewhere in this Netherlands UK blob. We are quite heavy on the, on the sampling in the UK and the Netherlands, to be honest. And then we start to see um, the TR34L98Hs fill out in this left hand side here and again they are in this sort of like this this western europe blob and then up to 2020 or well, 2019 actually when you see you can see that the majority of the tr34s are in the left hand side there are a few other polymorphisms in the right hand side that aren't tr34 and there's then these kind of like these ones in the middle there might be a tr34 here which is actually an american isolate but the majority kind of cluster in this left hand side so we denoted these um, two clades, we called them, and, and this, is, this is all down to Matt Fisher, I'll point this out. Um, you know, if you don't like it, complain to him. But he said clade A for clade azole and clade B for clade boring. So that's the reasoning behind that nomenclature. Um, so in clade A, the azole resistance, you've got 227, the azole resistance, and um, wild type for CYP51A is 92. So it's three, three ish to one ratio. Whereas in clade B, azole resistance is 28, wild type is 338. So it's actually a one to 12 ratio. So clade A predominantly has the azole resistance. Um, we've recently just had um, a paper accepted into Nature Microbiology. If any of you reviewed it, thank you so much. <laughs> um, this has been this 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 little project started three years ago um, as a, as a little side project. I thought it would just keep me occupied, um, and three years later, it's 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 actually become my life. We looked at just the genome diversity of aspergers within the UK because the diversity within the UK is representative of Aspergillus diversity globally. Um, and this was just over um, 200 isolates um, between 2005 and 2017. And the, the ratios, are, you know, you can still see that this clade A, clade B ratios are fairly well-ish similar to um, what we see globally as well. Um, but what we could see was that the, there was this, this clonal clade here, clade AA, because it's, it sits within clade A. They're all TR34L98H, um, but they're incredibly clonal. And it, we see this globally as well in that, um, I'll talk about that in a bit actually. Um, oh, my phone's just made a funny noise. That scared me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so we were really interested in, 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 in what this, this clone was. And, Interestingly, it's made up of 27 isolates 
and they are um, 14 are clinical, 14 are environmental. So nicely split. They are all the same mating type. They're found from all over um, the British Isles and Republic of Ireland. So Dublin, Aberdeen, the south of Wales, London and Brighton. Um, and they're all TR34, which is very interesting. And they're all um, highly related. So basically they were separated by less than 300 SNPs, 244 to be exact. And I did a little t-test on this just to see whether we would expect to see that um, sort of randomly or whether there is actually an association there. So the p-value was significant. Um, so actually you, you wouldn't expect to see uh, that sort of like level of SNPs. Um, between isolates. And anyone who's worked on aspergillus and sequenced it knows that if you just take it out of the freezer, it will gain a few thousand SNPs. Like it is, inc it is incredibly sort of di diverse. The global pairwise average of SNPs between isolates is over 150,000. So these, these isolates are incredibly highly related despite their geographic dispersal. Um, yeah, that's just a little PCA showing that clinically, environmentally, they are quite close. So we think that this shows that a clinical patient could not have acquired these, um, this aspergillus infection in any other way other than from the environment. Um, we do have anecdotal evidence that people are potentially, particularly cystic fibrosis patients, you know, they're coughing a lot, they could potentially expel aspergillus in their, in their coughs and things like that uh, when they're coughing. But, but we think that this shows that patients are acquiring drug-resistant aspergillus from the environment. This clade, as I mentioned, we do see it elsewhere in the world. We see it in um, Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands as well. Um, so is it sort of like some sort of global superfit clone? And we also see it over in um, Thailand and Vietnam as well. Um, and we know that the air currents kind of go sort of like west to east, and then they come over the southern hemisphere and then they kind of come back again. So we are kind of expecting this, this, this clone to kind of sweep back around and start popping up in um, Australia, sorry, um, and also a US at some point in like the next few years. Um, the UK and Thailand are separated by 500 SNPs. The Thai isolates kind of make their own little, like this little extra wing of, 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 the, of the clonal clade. So, you know, what makes, what makes these isolates tick? We're not quite sure. I haven't quite had the time to figure that out yet. What makes these isolates tick? They're still similar, but they are slightly different. Um, and then finally, just to wrap up, um, we, well, I say we, I did it, um, use this, this piece of software called TreeWAS by this, this guy called Xavier Didelo and a very talented, she's now a postdoc, um, Caitlin Collins. Um, they wrote TreeWAS, which basically takes into account the phylogeny, the phylogenetic structure um, when um, performing a GWAS, a genome-wide association. Um, and it identi and you, can, you can basically also pop in a phenotype as well. So for instance, I just popped in a binary, is it resistant to hydroconazole or is it not a resistant to hydroconazole? And as you'd expect, CYP51A, um, L98H was the predominant, the most significant um, loci to come out, the, the SNP that encodes that. But then there was, there, was also some, there was also some other interesting ones. There was just over 2000 loci associated with hydroconazole resistance. Um, some of them made sense to me, some of them didn't. And that's when we roped in uh, the, the guys at Manchester, so Mike Bromley and, and Norman Van Ryan, um, just to kind of like look at this a little bit more. So if you just see this graph here, you can see that it's just like these peaks and troughs all over the place. It's not just like the odd loci. They all seem to be bundled together. So when you look at FST, which is kind of a measure of, um, it's a measure of fixation. Um, it's kind of like a rough guesstimate to, to how, 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 how low, low si are undergoing selection and things like that. When you, when you line these up, you can see that these peaks and troughs line up with the FST. So you've got high FST values in chromosome one. You've also got low side that are associated with hydroconazole resistance. Chromosome four, where CYP51A is located, you're also seeing these high regions of FST and so on. It mirrors quite nicely. So there's these gene phenotype associations um, and this FST is when comparing clades A and B, by the way. 
Um, so, and the significant low sign in these regions map to genes involved in secondary metabolism, and including Fumitra Morgan, um, which is why I need to get Mike involved because he he's really into this secondary metabolism stuff, and I don't I have I have zero clue. So we got Norman to basically just do a really quick and dirty analysis. He just took um, 28 gene deletion muta mutations, uh, gene deletion mutants, sorry, from the Cofun knockout collection and screened them for growth on media containing nitroconazole. So CYP51A did not grow, which is good because we, you know, it's been knocked out. We'd expect that. And it's also ABCA. Um, we, and there has been a little bit of literature on this, so this is this is worth considering as well. Um, but basically, just just sort of going back, we need to test the flanking regions around these low side because there's clearly some linkage here going on. Um, just to sort of like um, test those a little bit more, and this is only 28 low side out of over 2,000 low side. So um, and it, and it's knocking out the whole gene as opposed to just taking out the specific low size. So it is a really quick and dirty approach, um, but it just kind of like was sort of a, a sanity check a little bit. Um, so I'm just gonna wrap up now because I'm realizing I'm getting to the end. So the public health threat posed by fungi is increasing, especially with the increase in COVID. I mean, we've seen what's happening in India. Um, we've seen what's happening in terms of COVID associated aspergillosis, so Kappa. Um, we've got new emerging immunosuppressed patient case classes especially those ones who were undergoing a brutinib um, treatment, those who've had flu, those who've had COVID, um, new emerging multidrug resistant fungal pathogens, C. aris. There's been a paper that came out in the last couple of months which suggests an environmental origin for C. aris. This is something that we've been sort of like speculating about for ages. Um, and, some, and there's this paper, a really nice paper that's genome sequenced um, samples in uh, coastal waters off the Andaman Islands. So this idea that it has a marine origin, which is something that Tom Chiller at the CDC um, and the mycology branch at the CDC have speculated for a long time. Um, new patterns of antifungal resistance caused by dual use of antifungals. And we've seen in, this, in Aspergillus, this emergence of this potentially super fit clone is high and, and it, which is resistant it's capable of spreading so there's this acute need to increase our focus and also the funding i attended a meeting um early in may and apparently the number of projects um for fungal research has that have been successfully funded within the uk has decreased over the last 10 years quite dramatically um i don't and apparent and the funding body actually said it's because they're not receiving applications which I think you know personally I kind of scoffed at because I know that we submit applications but um you know it's a case of if you're not being seen they're not gonna if you don't ask you don't get so we we know we really need to be kind of like pushing this one thing that we've that I haven't touched on is what and, and it's something that we do work on kind of like in this in the scenes is open access for surveillance systems. So this idea of just having um, this transmission specific analysis software. So when I was showing you the global and the UK Aspergillus, that was in um, um, a tool called MicroReact. And we are collaborating with the team that wrote MicroReact and also the CDC to kind of do, um, for first off, a candida auris sort of, um, sort of surveillance software, which includes transmission analysis as well um, and then hopefully we can expand that to other candida species because they're, they're they're generally the easiest to work with then crypto then aspergillus because aspergillus is a bit of a pain to work with um, so this could be the base of establishing more appropriate policies and practices um, which is desperately needed um, especially in this covid world so just to wrap up um briefly i have to mention the funders because you know yeah, they've been good. They've been good to us. Imperial, um, the team here, um, Thomas and Emily um, work heavily on Aspergillus and obviously Darius as well. PHE, we work uh, Public Health England, England. We work closely with Liz, Liz Johnson and Andy Borman there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. That was, um, that was fantastic. Really interesting. You're welcome. What's NERC, by the way? Natural Environment Research Council, which technically doesn't exist anymore because all the research councils in the UK just kind of got amalgamated into UKRI, which I'm not entirely sure what the RI stands for. Um, but basically, 
they, they, they still kind of exist in theory, um, but not, not, not officially, if that makes sense. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm sure that there are going to be quite a few questions, so I'm going to get mine in quickly <laughs> first. So we saw the same thing as you observed in uh, the UK and Vietnam with the, the difference between resistance rates in rural versus urban areas. So it was much mm. like the highest place was the urban areas, as we had not hypothesized. So what's your um, what's your thought? So we don't have the same thing with flower beds, so we can't blame on flower beds in Vietnam. So is it an urban thing? You got any ideas? I, um, no, <laughs> it's a short answer. No, because <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, normally it's 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 weird because when Jenny did the soil sampling, um, you know, sort of like citizen science thingy, um, I went around all the hospitals taking samples of all the flower pots outside the um, outside the hospitals, and there was, nothing grew, nothing grew. Which was really odd but saying like people's homes stuff grew so i don't know whether there's pollution sort of having an impact there because traditionally well you know where the hospitals are if you think about imperial um if you think about paddington st mary's hospital it's highly polluted whereas where people live tend to be in sort of like still urban but less polluted areas um, I, so that's, that's kind of like the only thing I can I can consider it's it's kind of a balance between there's lots of people about there's lots of sort of like activity from humans, but the pollution levels are slightly lower. I don't know. Yeah, it's a bit odd. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I, I've got. It's an you know, it's an interesting idea. We, we came up with Sorry. ideas for what's happening in Vietnam, but they yeah. definitely don't apply to what's happening in the UK, and it's the same. As you so there must be another unifying reason exactly but and we we just don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah exactly. so, we've got clear yeah who has any who wants to go first with a question you oliver you can do, i can't see everyone at once so ever, anyone oliver's waving yep yeah, oliver. oliver. um <clears throat> so uh flower beds um i don't know if you know tom rogers in yes Dublin. tom is yeah, lovely yeah. Yeah, um, I used to be one of his minions, and uh, he was trying to convince me uh, to send students to garden centers. Yes, um, a couple of years ago, and yes. so the thought was he, you know, knew mice and vervet, and they had the idea that it was um, tulip growers. Yeah, were one of the sources of yeah. azole resistance. Um, was that? ever born out because yeah so he carried on with that idea and um he had um a postdoc called katie dunn and they yep, published yeah and she, she's now gone into industry and is very happy i think she's had a couple of kids as well so she's extremely happy you can you, yeah she's just she's flourishing um and um they actually analyzed tulip bulbs and they published a paper on it showing that um the tulip bulbs were kind of the the harbingers of azon resistance aspergillus into the uk from holland and um jacques Mize was not happy no. he, was, he, was, no. he personally offended by it um but what was really interesting is then we we sort of like followed up with that and we thought okay well you know tulip bulbs okay but what about what about onions they're still bulbs right so can we test onions so we basically had a student go down to like the organic market versus tesco um and see the the rates of uh azole resistance in organic onions compared to tesco onions and again you can see the same sort of thing and we also had someone test um tea as well tea from um india slash burma um and um just looking at the amount of azole resistance in tea as well and, it, and it's there in, in your tea bags perhaps not pg tips but you know perhaps like sort of yeah. the the nicest stuff, the twinings yeah it's amazing and is, is, is this uh, quite a problem to sell because obviously yeah. people farmers don't like the idea that they, they can really use don't. their favorite toys no it's very hard to find a farmer who's happy for us to sample because you know, if we say, "Hey, we're trying to find this this you know pathogen in your soil that could potentially kill people," they'll just be like, "No, 
no, can't do that. And you can't exactly sort of like hop over the fence and just take it without their knowledge because that's unethical as well. So it's so just like the, the sign up rates are low, which is why the 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 air, the Burkhard, the air um air trap was so good because you could just you could just put that um on your land technically but next to a field and they can't say anything about it but soil different matter yeah yeah thank yeah, you people people are funny about it yeah thank you um so we have questions maybe we go tanya caitlin and julie so thank you very much, Joe, for a really interesting presentation. You're um, I was really interested in your comment about the association of fungal disease with uh, COVID patients, because we've really not seen it as that much of a problem. Admittedly, we haven't had anywhere near the number of cases you have. But I, I wondered if there were some specific associations. I mean, the things that come to mind clinically, I suppose, is a high incidence of underlying lung disease, for example. But are there any associations that you've picked up in relation to COVID and, and different fungal infections? Um, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a clinician. So oh, when, oh. When, when, da when Darius like tells me about stuff, sometimes I'm like in one ear and out the other because I have no idea. But it seems to be predominantly in those that have been mechanically ventilated right okay um um and we went that brief i don't know if you i don't know how much the coverage was over in in, in australia but um we did set up like these nightingale hospitals which were covid specific and mm -hmm. they didn't last very long because we didn't have the staff to actually man them but um the one in london um there were incidences where ca uh, candida auris was actually getting stuck in the ventilators mm -hmm. um and they and the you know, candidorus it's very you know it's tricky to get rid of anyway so the so we were also seeing candidorus as well as aspergillus in those that have been mechanically ventilated um but in terms of like other fungal diseases um we have had this outbreak and i cannot from a life of me pronounce it's something clavata something begin with s so Saf safrachet or something like that safrachet clavata we've we've been seeing that in people who aren't necessarily mechanically ventilated um and this is at uh, university college uh london hospital um and that's been pretty devastating actually that's been pretty horrible um so the clinician leading that is neil stone he used to work for tahana on crypto and now he's sort of well, I think he still wants to work on crypto, but COVID intervened. So it's it's kind of I say the major, majority of times it's just those who have been mechanically ventilated. If there's any sort of and if there's anything else, I don't know because I'm not I'm not that clever. I'm not sure. I'm not that sort of like on my on my clinical knowledge. You know, it'd be like Tahana and Darius would know that more than me. But if, yeah, for our point of view, for Aspergillus, for Kappa, it's it's just the mechanical ventilation. We've just had more of it because we haven't handled it well. Have we here? So really yes, yeah. we've, we've seen we've seen loads of kappa over in America as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Caitlin. Thanks. I've got a technical question, um, and feel free to defer it. Um, and I might be. So uh, when I last saw your presentation, we we're looking at the tree wise analysis that you you did, and we we're looking at potentially doing it on Canada tropicals, and I haven't progressed it, but. Um, from a limited reading, it's more for haploid organisms. How did, do you have any comments on its application, any challenges for diploid organisms? Um, no, I don't have any comments. I haven't tried it on a diploid organism. In theory, it should work fine because you're just going to have heterozygous um, and you're just going to have a mix of heterozygous and homozygous SNPs to deal with. Um, so I think it's just a case of um yeah I think, I think that will i think it would work to be honest i think probably the best thing to do would be to run it through something like gubbings or clonal frame just to remove um any sort of like regions of recombination as well which might make it a little bit easier um and then run it through tree was. um but in, th in theory it should work just fine really yeah thank you give it a go give it a go see what happens if not xavier is very responsive to re emails because he wants people to use it right yeah. and so he will do he will do whatever he he can to help that happen yeah especially if it's something new and exciting yeah okay 
Thanks. Uh, Julie. Thanks, Jay. That was a really nice uh, presentation. I, I just Thank wanted you. to ask you, so um, it looks like the resistance that you're getting is not confined to the azole, sorry, to the agostrol biosynthetic pathway. Is that, exactly. is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's actually one of the reviewers' comments as well. And it's just a case of, okay, how do we, how do we show that? You know, how do we test that? So, which is why we've got Mike Bromley on board because that's kind of what he's going to run with for the next, you know, God knows how long to kind of try and show that it's it's just so it's it's more complex than we you know we realize, and it's just it's not limited to just one pathway. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, just so like I some just sort of cross interaction. Mention to you that um, we were at a an ASM meeting last week and Kylie Boyce who works on cryptococcus resistance uh, she works in Melbourne I think at La Trobe mm. and she gave a really nice presentation uh, demonstrating the same thing in cryptococcus so um, it'd be really valuable to look at that literature because, exactly um, exactly and obviously with cryptococcus you you have ploidy changes which contribute to the resistance and that's something that we we just we don't look at in aspergillus because we go we know there's drug resistance polymorphisms, you know, single amino acid and, and TR mutations in the, in the promoter. We just go, that's it. And actually, in terms of, you know, CCNVs and copy number variation or whole chromosome or copy, copy um, you know, duplication, we just don't look at it. So actually, that could be something, and we've completely missed it. And it was actually one of the reviewers' comments, so I've got my work cut out for like the next few months. So yeah, yeah, no, it's, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, hey. who else we got? Um, D. I've got D. Thanks, Joe. That was a really interesting talk. I was really interested in the phylogenetic tree that you showed, where you have so many azole resistance ones in one branch and very few on the other. Yeah. So, and I'm assuming that on the one with lots of them, that they aren't just from a single origin, that they've evolved independently. At least a lot of them have. Well, that's 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 next on my to-do list to see whether um, TR34 L98H has evolved from a single origin or not. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's going to be quite a complex analysis to do. But now we're starting to see TR34 pop up in the other clades. Right. Is that some sort of recombination, like a massive recombination event and it's switched over? Or is it, you know, a, a a second spontaneous emergence. Um, when we when we looked at it in terms of just straf typing, um, so just so just microsatellite typing, we could see that well, we hypothesized that it just emerged on a single background, a single genetic background. But clade A and B are so different, um, we don't think that that is the case anymore. But that I'm put, I'm put, I'm putting like a huge lump of salt with that because I haven't tested it but it, it's on my to-do list so yeah. do you think if that's the case that clade b will become mm. highly resistant as well exactly yeah, exactly so already yeah so clade b is the yeah. one that's got all the g54 mutations um it's got you know it's got all this sort of like weird so like just just single amino acid changes that confer drug resistance whereas clade a tends tends to have the more complex um polymorphisms that are also linked to a, tran a, a tandem repeat. So clay B, it's kind of ripe, really, for, for sort of like spinning out more uh, drug resistance mutations. Or is it a case that we just haven't sampled enough? Right. Because the genetic diversity is huge. The panel that's waiting for me in London at the moment is full of isolates from Jen, and she sang the sequence, some of them, and, and, the, and the, just, just the, the polymorphism that she's got are just so vast. It's incredible. So, you know, if you were to, if you were to sort of like come back to me in a month, I'd be like, actually, do you know what? The pictures can change completely. So it's just, it's just constantly changing. Right. Has anyone ever tried to do like experimental evolution on these strains just to see if you can evolve? This no, thing? no, it's something, it's actually something that I keep putting in for funding to do experimental evolution on a range of organisms, including aspergillus, also aris as well, and it just keeps getting rejected. It's just too bad. Yeah. So if, <laughs> if you know of it, if you have, you know of anyone who's got a spare pot of money. <laughs> yeah. Not here in Australia. I'll keep trying though. I'll keep trying. <laughs>
yeah thank you you're welcome That's thank you really interesting discussion as well do um does anyone else have a final question before we uh, wrap up um yep can i ask a quick question slightly related to d's i don't know how much this will make your life complicated but going back to the phylogenetic tree yeah have those been mapped to the you know subspecies in the aspergillus fumigatus complex oh, no. <clears throat> so yeah yeah. yeah. So basically, they're all mapped to AF293, okay. which is, in my opinion, a bit of a crappy reference. Um, because when you look at the sort of the amounts of insertions and deletions, you can see that there's, you know, either there's been some massive deletion events in Aspergillus in general, or AF293 is, is actually just a bit weird in itself and isn't representative of Aspergillus in general. So um, we were kind of waiting on CA10 being um, resequenced and RNA seeked to have the, the gene annotations. And that was being done by Paul Bowyer. Um, still waiting on that. I've been waiting for a while. Um, so basically we've just got funding to do four pack bio aspergillus sequences plus RNA seq. So that is currently being done. Um, got a bit of a problem here in that because like some people voted to leave the EU, we can't get stuff shipped from the mainland to do our sequencing, which is a bit of a oh, no. problem. It's all stuck in customs. Like who knew that would happen, hey? Anyway, um, politics again. Um, <laughs> So we're doing the, we're doing four pack bio sequences to get some high quality reference genomes. Basically, we're going to do two clade A's and two clade B's, one environmental, one clinical, um, for each, in order to basically have clade specific references. Yeah, okay. and hopefully that should help resolve. I realise I should have chosen my words better because oh. you're a bioinformaticist and I'm more of a mycologist, so. Say okay. mapping them was, you know, not necessarily about sequencing. It was um, oh. more about have you identified to the subspecies level each of your isolates to see ah, if yes. some of the yes. clustering. Oh, I see what you mean. So there. have they have yeah, were they were they were they checked beforehand? Yes. So they're they're always molded off and and whatever is required. As I said, I'm not that, I'm not that great in the lab. Um so we've got this lovely person called Sam Hemmings who does all of that and Prior to that, it was Ali doing everything. Um, and occasionally some slip through the net. So we do end up with some that we think are Aspergillus fumigatus, and they turn out to be something like Neolypticus. Um, but um, they're obvious when you put them in the biology. Yeah, but around. even within fumigators, it's not a strict it's not, it's, it's a, It is a cryptic species completely. Yeah, yeah so exactly. So they, they are the all... Variations related to that. Exactly. So they, they are all checked for that to make sure that they're sensor stricto. Um, just with your, you, you said you uh, put a spore collector out at Rothenstead. Yeah. Did you speak to them about looking at some of their really old soil samples? So that's obviously Bart Fry. Yeah. And yeah, then I, he's... I know Bart a little bit. Yeah, Bart is no longer at Rothenstead. He's oh, okay. somewhere else. I can't remember where off the top of my head. Um, basically, Rothamstead cut their staff last year dramatically, so he's had to go. So, yes, it was one of the things that was kind of um, a deliverable on the on the NERC grant, which finished last year, and then we got the Welcome Trust grant to look at clinical aspergillus. Um, but given um, his institute move, that hasn't quite panned out. But it, it is, yeah, we know that they've got um, extensive um, air and soil samples, so, yeah. It's just um, on. If, if you need another contact there, I can probably put you in touch. Good. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, because we've lost all all insiders at Robinstead now. Okay. Well, I can get you hooked Thank up. You. I good. guess. Yes. Nice. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Joe. That was a great talk. Oh, Caitlin, have you? No, just a great discussion. I thought you should snuck an extra question in. We are out of time. <laughs> thanks, Caitlin. So That's fine. thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for making the time. It was really That's all right. Really Go good. home. Have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. Stay Bye. safe, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.